In this video, Bill is going to talk to you about the five types of frame damage. You got sag, side sway, uh, mash, diamond, and twist. And he's going to go over the different types of frame damage with you. Hey, this is Donnie Smith, and we have Bill with us, and he's going to go over some lessons over structural today. He is going to go over structural analysis and damage repair. Uh, we're going to talk about 5.3 through 5.7, which is basically the five types of frame damage. You've got your mash, sag, sideway, twist, and diamond. So, Bill, you want to go ahead and take it over? Yeah. Let me put my, my screen up here. All right. So, welcome. We're going to talk about frame damage conditions, and mainly the five, which was mash, side sway. Uh, sag, twist, and diamond. And let's just jump right into it. Should be nice and short. Um, mainly when you want to do any kind of damage analysis when we're looking at these frame conditions, uh, the inspection, when you do your initial inspection, the estimator or the frame repair technician, there's going to be some dead giveaways uh, of what kind of frame damage you have just off the, based off the initial inspection of the vehicle. So when you're looking at the inspection, um, Information from the customer, first of all, is very important. Uh, where were they traveling? How fast were they traveling? Um, what was the direction of impact? That's gonna be a dead giveaway of some of the frame conditions. And what did they hit? Was it a deer or a pole? Or did they go over a bump or a median that caused any kind of other uh, damage? So that's gonna kind of clue you into what you should be looking for right away. It's gonna help eliminate a lot of other things. Uh, start looking over the entire vehicle. You're looking at the direct damage area. That's going to be a dead giveaway of some frame conditions. Indirect damage, so where are the buckles? Um, and looking at panel gaps. The panel gaps are a really good one too because they're going to show you a lot as far as uh, misalignment of the frame. If you have panel gaps that are uneven on when you do side-to-side -side comparisons, you're going to be able to tell right away if there is frame damage. Before we jump into the uh, five conditions, I just want to make sure we understand the dimensions that we're measuring from. Um, when we talk about the length dimension, so that's our zero plane. If you look at the green box here, that is our zero plane. So it's just a reference point anywhere that can be placed on the vehicle, usually in the center section, that establishes a length measurement. So from that green box forward or rear, you're uh, establishing your length measurement, and um, that is your zero plane. Your width or your center line, if you look at this yellow box here, it actually runs from the front of the vehicle all the way down to the rear of the vehicle. That is your, um, your width measurement. So from the center line out is what you're measuring from and you're gonna establish those type of measurements. And then your height is also called the datum plane or the datum plane. Uh, it's a base reference point underneath the vehicle. So most uh, frame measuring systems establish this uh, plane through their measuring system or through their frame rack. And then it measures up to create a height measurement uh, for your frame. So that is your height measurement. And we're working in three dimensions. So you got your length, width, and height. So let's talk about our first frame damage here. And that is the mash condition, the most common condition you'll probably find when you start doing any kind of frame damage analysis. Um, may also be called the collapse uh, condition. And basically what it is, it's a, my computer's doing funny things here. Um, the length of the structural part shortens. So it could be in the front, could be in the rear. Um, but basically it is a length, uh, the specification of the length is out of specification. Easy to identify because if you look at the damage, things are pushed back or pushed forward. Let me go back a slide here. So what I want to do is kind of draw it out. Usually this is what I do with my students. I'll help have them start with this box and then we'll draw out the frame conditions. Just kind of help visually connect what the frame condition is and how to visualize it. So um, bear with me here. I think I got everything set up. So the mash condition, you are gonna kind of see this. Things are gonna be pushed back. They're gonna be kinked. So say this is the front of the car here. We're facing forward. And like I said before, with your length measurement, you're looking at the zero plane. So say we set up a zero plane right here in the center of the vehicle. And when we do our measurement with the 3D system, um, the length shows up to be short on one side or the other, okay? And it shows to be pushed back or pushed forward, whatever the um, damage condition is. That's how you're gonna identify mash. So 
your length condition is shortened compared to the zero plane. And usually you're gonna identify it by either kinks or uh, buckles, just that the part is moved and easily identified that way. Anything you wanna to add to that? No, sounds good. All right, um, moving right along. Let me clear out things here. Side sway condition. So what happens is the collision forces push the structural part to one side or the other. Um, your width measurement is out of specification at that point. So if we were to draw it out, we're gonna draw our center line down the vehicle here. And then what's gonna happen is the frame rallies are either gonna be pushed to one side or the other. So the frame rail might actually come out towards this way. Now that's an exaggeration, but what's gonna happen is your width measurement is gonna be changed at that point compared to specification. So now it's gonna show an alignment out towards one side or the other. Um, a good way to identify just by looking at panel gaps is a side to side comparison. So the side that, or if it gets pushed to the, say the passenger side, if you look at the passenger side fender, the panel gap is gonna be real tight. If you look at the driver side fender, that panel gap is gonna be a little bit wider. So that's a good indication of side sway right off the bat. Now I don't know with all systems, uh, you might, like if it's pushed towards away from the center section, that's positive. And if it's towards the center section, it's negative. Yeah, it's different for a lot of systems. Um, I know with the chief, they don't really use a positive negative. They use a color coding, I guess. Okay. And they use, it, it makes it actually really user friendly where they use arrows. So they'll show arrows of which direction it's out of specification. Um, but yeah, there are some that show negative numbers. So negative would be, um, I guess, pushed towards that line and positive be pushed away. From that line. Uh, next damage condition is sag or kick up uh, and basically what happened is the structural part is pushed up or down. Uh, it causes a change in height measurement so we're looking at our rail down here from the side of the vehicle and like we talked about before we have an established, established datum plane which is down here and what you're going to get is the specification is going to be out height wise. So we draw our rail kind of sagging down here. And now from this point to your datum plane, there's gonna be an off measurement as far as height goes. So causes a change in height. What you're gonna see uh, upon visual inspection is the panel gaps are gonna be tight at the top, or I'm sorry, tight at the bottom and wide at the top. Or it could be vice versa if you're looking at a kick up type of situation where the rail actually gets pushed up. Now you're gonna have tight gaps at the top of the uh, fender. Say you're looking at a fender to door gap, tight gaps at the top, real wide gaps at the bottom. So that's your sag kick up condition. In a twist condition, this one's a little bit harder to visualize. What's happening is the center section of the vehicle is out of alignment. The rail ends are not level with each other and it's rarely gonna occur in a unibody vehicle. You're gonna see it more likely in a body of a frame vehicle or the full frame vehicle, just because with the unibody vehicle, the panels do a good job of distributing energy and not allowing it to get that far into the center section of the vehicle. Uh, whereas your body of a frame, you have those two big parallel frame rails. Uh, when the energy travels through, you're more likely to get that twist condition. But basically what's gonna happen, and let's see if I can draw this out the best I can. Um, from the center section, you're gonna get one side of the frame rail that's gonna kind of kick up a little bit. And then usually it, it, it kind of shows in the back end too. So this back end would kick down a little bit. And now you kind of see that twist condition. So one side's up, one side's down. And right at the center, the two parallel lines aren't even with each other and you have a, a misalignment right at the center there. So that's a good dead giveaway of a twist condition. But again, you're gonna see it more likely in the body of our frame vehicles. Um, door overlap's a good uh, panel gap check for that one. So if on one side of the vehicle, both doors are pushed up or they're overlapping the top of the pillar there, um, most likely that's gonna be a twist condition just because that, again, that center section is out of level. And then finally, the diamond condition. Um, 
what's happening is one side of the structure is either moved forward or backwards. The center section's out of square. And again, more likely to be found on your body over frame vehicles, just because again of that parallel rail design. Um, you go back here. So your diamond condition, what's gonna happen is you're gonna have one side gets pushed back or pushed forward. And it's gonna create what you think, what exactly what the name is, is that diamond look to it, or at least in the measurement readings, you're gonna have that diamond look to it. So um, again, this side gets pushed back, that's out of alignment, which is gonna cause that side to get pushed forward and be out of alignment as well. So when we talk about these, don't think about these damage conditions as individual conditions that are gonna happen in an accident. They're most likely gonna happen in multiple ways. So you're gonna have mash, side sway, and sag all at once, just because when the car, when that sudden impact happens or when that sudden force stops, not only is it getting pushed back, but it might be getting pushed to the side or getting pushed down. Uh, somebody's braking real hard, most likely things are gonna get pushed down because the nose is diving. Uh, in rear end accidents, you're gonna have the kick up and mash because again, things are getting pushed up and forward. So you're gonna have multiple conditions and you gotta really uh, account for those conditions when you're making your pools. And that's why it's hard to break down each one individually when you're talking about making pools. Uh, you really have to look at everything all together. So you're like this picture here, you're gonna have multiple attachments and multiple hookups when you're making your pools to try to reverse that damage and pull out those uh, structural uh, frame damages. So um, you're gonna require the multiple pulls and it's probably gonna happen simultaneously if you have a frame rack or equipment that's set up to do that. You can attach it at a couple different spots and then kind of take pressure and move it as you go in different ways uh, to help avoid any kind of kinking or locking of the metal as you're pulling it out. So that's, um, that's the biggest thing or biggest advice I can give as far as when you're making pulls for any of these types of damages. Um, the last thing I wanna do is just for the people who are watching this, if they wanna give it a try, I usually do this with my students. Uh, when we start talking about uh, looking at frame measurement sheets and trying to decipher what the damage is, um, this is a good exercise here. So if you take a look at the numbers, just to get yourself familiar with it, at the top here, you have your height measurements. So your right side, left side, top, bottom, right side, left side, that's your height measurement. In the center here, you have your center line measurement. So right side, left side, center line measurement. And then at the bottom, you have your length measurement. And uh, again, right side, left side. So try to take a look at those numbers, see what you can come up with as far as what damage conditions there. Um, even you could tell right away where the impact was. If you start looking at the numbers real closely, you'll know which side it was hit on and then what kind of damage condition this has. And then I would have my students tell me how would they make a pool to uh, correct that damage condition? So that's, uh, that's pretty much it for damage conditions. Nice and easy. Yeah, and I used to tell my, or I tell my students, uh, these be a lot more predetermined how the accident is going to happen. Mm -hmm. Most people they hit their brakes and turn slightly one way or the other. Right. But since texting, that's not all. It's not too bad on the time anymore. <laughs> that theory is kind of out the window because there's a lot of that not happening. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, what I'm seeing, uh, and again, most likely you're going to be dealing with front end, rear end collisions. That's what I talk a lot about. With your side impacts, you can still have mash and side sway and uh, diamond conditions. And that, I think with a unibody structure, if you have a, an impact on the side, that's where you're most likely going to see any kind of diamond condition or twist condition just because at that point when the rocker takes a hit, could cause the floor section to twist or uh, go out of alignment. So um, yeah, you, it's really the investigation in the beginning, understanding how the car was hit, what hit it, um, the twist condition, and uh, yeah, mostly the twist condition, you're gonna see a lot with vehicles that might've gone airborne and come down or might've hit something from the bottom, causing that to the frame to twist like that. So. Yeah, it's definitely important to understand what hit it or how it was hit. And another thing, a lot of my students get this confused anyway, like what is right and left? You know, and it's oh, like yeah. you're sitting in the car, you know, your left and right. Uh, kind of important, like if you're doing frame measurements to know for sure. Sounds simple, but 
a lot of my students, you know, some students don't know that. Yeah. Or if you're if you're looking at it backwards, you know, make sure you order the correct <laughs> fender. You know? Yeah, exactly. So it's like yeah. if you're sitting in there looking forward, you know, right and left. Yeah, usually I do try to add in, you know, right passenger side, left driver side, just to to help the students visualize it a little bit. Because if you could pull on the wrong side, <laughs> it might not work out too good. <clears throat> but, yeah, the, it, pulling is really a, it takes a lot of thought when you first get into it. And it's frustrating in the beginning because when you're still new at it and you don't know what you're doing, things start pulling out and they, they don't pull the right way and you get, things start tearing, they buckle yeah. in the other direction. And then, you know, you're sitting there cursing and, you know, just throwing things at that point. And then you think you got it about right and release and it goes about halfway yeah, right back. <laughs> yep. Yeah, always got to shock it. Always got to make sure you relieve that stress. So, yeah. And uh, again, it's uh, with those conditions. In so I did a lot of estimating in my uh, in the shop that I worked for, and that was good for establishing one that you know what you're talking about, and two, more time on the estimate for making those pools. So you you list them separately. You say, okay, we got side sway. Well, we're gonna have to make a pool for side sway. You got mash. We're gonna have to make a pool for mash. And uh, then you can kind of justify your labor times at that point a little bit better instead of just saying set up and pull at the top of the estimate and, uh, you know, trying to put a big chunk of time there and get paid for it. You're the only one that asked for that? Yeah, yeah all the time, yeah. <laughs> Nobody else is asking for that. <laughs> uh, insurance famous lines. So, yeah, that's it. Okay, well. Thank you for taking the time again today to help us out here. Uh, a lot of students are watching this, learning from home, so we really, really appreciate you taking the time. Not a problem at all. So there you have it. That is the five types of frame damage. I thank you for watching these videos. If you have any questions or comments, you can go down and leave those below. Thanks for watching. Take care, and we'll see you in the next video.